Hello, gentle marketers. Welcome to episode 37 of the Gentle Business Revolution podcast, the show where we talk about marketing your business by disrupting the current marketing paradigm. As always, I'm Sarah Zanacroce. I'm the host here on this show. And you know that you're in the right place. If you are a heart-centered entrepreneur or change maker who is looking for a different, a better way to market your business, or you are simply an entrepreneur who's tired and kind of sick of the traditional marketing model and are ready for a paradigm shift. You might also be a marketing impact pioneer, someone who's working for an organization, maybe a B Corp, who does business for good. Real quick, before we begin, if you're new to this show, if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm so glad and happy that you're here. Uh, if you haven't downloaded my one-page gentle marketing mandala with the seven email prompts um, to help you on this journey to a gentler marketing paradigm, then I would highly recommend that. Uh, you can find it at sarasanacroce.com forward slash one page, the number one page. And I'm saying that because it Having seen the mandala with the seven Ps, uh, this is a revisited model of the seven Ps of marketing. So in the form of a mandala and seeing that it will really help you understand how I structure this podcast, because I always try to fit the conversations under one specific P. And today's episode, for example, fits under the P of people. So again, if you don't have it yet, grab your copy at sarasanacroce.com forward slash one, the number one page. So today I have a returning guest, Jeffrey Shaw, and he was actually my last guest of the previous edition of my earlier podcast, the one about introverts, because he's a fellow introvert. And you can find that conversation at sarasanacroce.com forward slash episode 85. If you're curious to kind of hear how Jeffrey runs his business being an introvert. So we talk much more about this idea of being an introverted entrepreneur. But today we're mainly speaking about Jeffrey's book, Lingo, and his approach to marketing, because I definitely see him as a gentle marketer. So let me tell you a bit more about him. As a keynote speaker and brand message consultant, Jeffrey Shaw, a renowned former portrait photographer, helps companies stop wasting time trying to satisfy some customers who will never be satisfied and attract only their ideal customers. Like a photographer captures the essence of a person, Jeffrey shows businesses how to make customers feel seen, heard, and understood. When that happens, you attract and retain your ideal customers by learning how to speak their lingo. Jeffrey Shaw is a TEDx speaker, host of Cre the, the Creative Warriors podcast, which I highly recommend, with well over 500 episodes and over a million downloads, and best-selling author of Lingo, Discover Your Ideal Customer's Secret Language and Make Your Business Irresistible. So I'm super excited for this episode, and we talked about uh, his book, Lingo, uh, also about bringing empathy to marketing, and this idea of aspirational marketing that uh, I really love the term that he came up with and talked about on his podcast before, so I brought that up. So I'm really excited to share this conversation with you. Here we go. Hi, Jeffrey. So good to speak to you. You too, Sarah. I'm glad to be here with you. Thank you. Yes, it's nice to have you back. You're a returning guest uh, on my last uh, podcast that was still under the introvert kind of uh, chapter. You were my last guest on uh, sarahzanacroce.com forward slash episode 85. Uh, we're talking not about introversion this time, even though it would be actually a good topic right now because we're recording this during COVID-19 and we're all being asked to somehow be introverted, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I know that, you know, some people have jokingly said that, you know, this is, this is what introverts have always been waiting for, yeah. um, you know, but it is regardless, it's a huge uh, settling. And I do actually think I have a great deal of compassion for those that aren't naturally introverts, right? Because this must be a huge adjustment for them. I mean, I'm used to working at home, 
for those of us that are working used to working at home or, or tend to be more introverted, this is maybe a little bit an easier an adaptation. Um, but gosh, I have so much compassion for people where this is a major, major life change. It's a big change. I agree. Uh, for me already, it's a big change to have everybody at home. Usually nice. I have the house to myself. <laughs> and so I cannot imagine how it must feel as an extrovert to, you know, not be able to, you know, have a team to talk to, not be able to communicate all the time. So, so yeah, uh, I feel the same compassion yeah. and not, um, yeah, uh, there's been other uh, introverted posts where I uh, they were kind of making fun of extroverts. I don't think that's the right reaction to have. It's just like, oh, you, you know, you have a superpower. You are able to be alone for a very right. long time. So yeah, yeah, that absolutely. Is, um, something we should appreciate even more now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So in this episode, though, I wanted to talk to you about your book Lingo because it's a big reference for us here, uh, especially in my uh, marketing program, Gentle Marketing. And I refer to it all the time. And I also say, uh, and you can tell me how you feel about this, but I say that customer-centric marketing is actually overrated and that we should start with ourselves. And mm -hmm. so the first two Ps of the gentle marketing mandala are actually about passion or purpose and personal power, which could be defined as values and worldview. And then comes the P of people. Mm. And I think the first two Ps are essential because if we want to work with our ideal clients, and you talk about ideal clients a lot, we need to actually first know who we are ourselves as entrepreneurs, what our worldview is and, and what our lingo is so that we can then go and attract the right kind of people. Right. Yeah. And I've noticed in my conversations with entrepreneurs, if we don't take the time and give ourselves to the permission to go into who we really are and finding out, then often we skip to the customer and we look at the right. avatar and, you know, all these kind of traditional marketing models. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious what you think mm -hmm. about that. So I can actually tell you a little story about that and, and that I wrote the entire book, Lingo, um, and as you know, as one does, I, I was preparing for a podcast tour. I knew I'd be doing a lot of podcast interviews. My goal was to do a hundred and three months. So, uh, and as is often the case, they're recorded way in advance. So the book was actually in the editing phase when I started doing podcast interviews. And host after host would ask me, you know, I would, we would go into all the strategies of lingo, and then they would say to me, "Well, how do we know who our ideal customer is?" And I realized I wrote the entire book and never approached that because I made this huge assumption that everybody knows who their ideal customer is. And then I realized actually most people don't. Mm -hmm. So I went back and wrote what is now chapter two after the introduction, uh, starting with that because it is the starting point. And the type, the name of that chapter says it all and aligns with what you're saying, which is who will love that? Mm -hmm. So really the goal of finding your ideal customers, your ideal clients is understanding yourself, understanding your differentiators, your, what you bring to the table that's unique, what makes you passionate, like really getting, really honing in on a, kind of what I call the new niche, right? The, the old niche is about doing one thing to one group of people, but the new niche is the core thing that's within you. And then once you define that, then you ask the fundamental question, which is, and who will love that? Because there's a market out there for everything. Like one of my core principles is there's a world of people waiting for you to show up. But in order for you to show up, you have to show up with clear understanding of what you have to offer, who you're meant to serve. And of course, by my principles, you need to understand then the lingo of those that you're going to serve in order to create the brand messaging that connects you. But absolutely, I agree with you 100%. It really does begin fundamentally with understanding ourselves before we can figure out what we're offering to others. Yeah. So in a way, you reverse the module as well. I didn't remember that uh, so precisely, but it's true. You 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 did also kind of start with that, and then you you said, well, who would love instead of let me find my Correct. ideal clients, who would who would love what I have to share? Right. And, and it's. And, it, and you're touching on a, on a really key point, which is that this is why I believe my book Lingo has resonated so much because 
to, um, throughout history, business has always been written for, it seems like other people, right? When, mm-hmm. when I started my podcast, Creative Warriors, it was really designed to be a podcast for, for you know, those, those self-employed warriors who are willing to put themselves out there in the world because I felt and still feel there's a huge lacking of strategy that works for us. Right. right strategies that work for big business, even small businesses, uh, feel very different. You know, I, I've been playing a lot lately with the whole terminology of being self-employed. Uh, I think there's something very interesting by the fact that you know, on its surface, it means that we employ ourselves. But what I think is even more interesting is that to be self-employed is really a journey of oneself. <laughs> and I yes. think there's a really interesting play on words there. I've always said that to be self-employed is a personal is personal development on steroids. Right. Right. So it really does require that. Like I said, that's why I approached it that way, and always have approached it that way. That it really requires, as you said, kind of a reverse engineering because it is opposite of the way business has always told us to be. And then those of us that are self-employed, creative warriors, small businesses, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, we get out there in the world and it, everything, it just instinctively doesn't feel right to us and we don't know what's wrong. And what's wrong is that it seems like the rest of the world is doing everything backwards from the way we think we should do it. And we're kind of correct. Yeah. And it's interesting because even bigger companies now are standing, are starting to understand that idea, like I just talked to Jeff from from the purpose advantage. Yeah. So this idea of purpose that was never a thing, right? Yeah. Uh, Twenty years ago, it was always about um, you know the product, and then let's fit our product to the uh, client avatar. And now we're starting to go back to the the origin story and what is the purpose of the company. So even bigger companies are starting to realize that the self is actually. Uh, equally important. Yeah, most of, you know, and I, I do consult in a fair number of companies as well. And what I've had to learn to do is stay true to who I am and understand why they want to hire me. And same thing with the podcast. And, you know, I gear the show towards self-employed. But the fact of the matter is, I know very large companies that also listen to the show, but they listen to it because they are progressive companies mm-hmm. that embrace the idea. Uh, and what can be gained from entrepreneurs. So when I work with a company, I, it's, a, it's almost hard for me to stay true to myself because I feel like I'm supposed to be somebody other than I am, like more corporate minded. But the mm. fact of the matter is, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I've never had a job. I've never received a paycheck. And <clears throat> I can serve them best if I stay true to my entrepreneurial spirit because that's actually what they want to learn and gain. And you know, something I've been thinking about during this COVID-19 time is, you know, we were in a moment, a moment ago talking about the difference between introversion and extroversion. I think another thing that we're seeing is that, you know, the ups and downs, the uncertainty, this is ingrained in the entrepreneurial experience. Like, bring it on. Like, we, we know, and this is an opportunity, I think, for big companies to actually learn from the spirit of creative warriors, self-employed, and entrepreneurs. Because, this is our normal existence. As scary as all this is, this is not unusual for us. Uncertainty, ups and downs, all of a sudden the economy tanking. This is not new for us mm-hmm. unless you're a brand new startup, but this is not new. Right. Right. So if you truly, any company, if they want to learn the true spirit of entrepreneurship, like you're seeing it in action because it's us self employed. That, and us entrepreneurs, that we've got the resilience, we've got the, the strength of mind to get through this, and we will. Yeah, that's so interesting that you bring that up. Also, what you said about you feeling kind of, um, you know, insecure in front of big corporations and things like that. Um, I'm writing the gentle marketing book and, and I, my coach encouraged me to add a chapter at the end that talks about, you know, talks to companies uh, about bringing gentle marketing to their business. And, and I was like, no, you know, this is just an individual journey. Nobody's going to even care at, at companies. But she's like, well, you don't know, um, you know, people are people. And even within companies, there are people. And I also believe that the time is right. And, and, you know, especially now with what we're going through, 
there is going to be a, a switch in, uh, you know, also in bigger companies. And, and who knows, maybe they will be open to the idea of, um, you know, gentle marketing, or in your case, uh, they are, already are. And so that's, that's encouraging. So. so Sarah, I have to tell you that they will have no choice. Yeah. Now here, you know, I actually just broadcast an episode on my podcast, which I called The After Effect, because first of all, this is, this is not my first rodeo. I've been in business 35 years. So this is easily my third, you know, once in a lifetime world changing event, right? We had 9-11 and I was a New Yorker in 9-11 and then the Great Recession and now this. So here's one common denominator I can absolutely say with full confidence is that there is a tremendous after effect from event, life-changing events like this. And it's not in the immediate after effect, it is years later. What happens is, uh, and I'll tell you, I interviewed a podcast guest the other day that gave it the best term. He called it a spike in humanity. Mm -hmm. But what happens in crisis like these, as is 9-11 and the recession, is everybody's values shift. Mm -hmm. So what the point I was making in the podcast episode I broadcast today and the, the, the after effect was we need to be thinking now as businesses, we need to be thinking now in what way are, is the world's value shifting? In what way are the values and lives of those we serve shifting? Because that's going to have a major effect on our businesses years from now, because the world will never be the same. Yeah. Your values aren't aligned with the, the new perspective of the world. You're going to fail. And we're seeing businesses already that, are, that seem kind of tone deaf. They seem a little out of beat with what's sensitive in the area. And we see other companies that are doing a really good job, you know, authentically feeling like they're really getting the problem. And that's going to become very clear in future years. And again, it will literally eliminate some businesses, some industries, because people just won't value the same thing as they had valued before. Uh, I know this firsthand because I had built my photography business in the 80s and 90s. I built that business, quite honestly, from a rather mixed materialistic viewpoint. Right? I built up my name as a label, a designer label that one would choose me as a photographer, not just because I was skilled at what I did, but because I was the it photographer amongst affluent families. And I promoted myself as being exclusive because I was only meant to be for the chosen few, if you will. Well, after 9-11, that was absolutely the wrong brand messaging. Mm -hmm. It was the wrong lingo. It, we, we weren't living in a world that, tr that valued exclusivity. It was about being inclusive. Mm -hmm. And it was far less about material goods and choosing you know, for that reason, but rather choosing for genuineness and authenticity. And that was all who I was. So to me, it was a grateful shift. I was, gr I was grateful to shift in that direction, which always felt more true to who I was. But I think what something businesses have to be aware of right now on the after effect of COVID-19 is how will the world change? How will the values of those they serve change such that they do need to have a different lingo so that their businesses aren't perceived as tone deaf or uncaring? And I think big, big or small, particularly big businesses are, who tend to be slower to move, that's going to be a big factor. We're going to see who does it and who doesn't. Yeah, I see. Uh, my husband is working for a big Amer American company, and and yeah, I see um, things crumbling, <laughs> and um, you know, big businesses that are not built with the human uh, at its center. I think those are the ones who are going to crumble because really, what we're going through now is a shift of paradigm, a shift of you know, the, 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 basically the destruction of the power systems. Yeah. And uh, you're, you're totally right. We, we need to be prepared for that. And uh, I think you and I both are, so that's great. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I, 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 tell, I love, like, so as David Premier, um, Premier, excuse me, David Premier is his name. He's the one that came up, coined the term, which he had never said before. He said he said it for the first time on our podcast, which was the spike in humanity. Yeah. And it really is. I mean, it tends the va people's values tend to shift for the better. Yeah. Right? And we're seeing it now. I mean, as amongst all the tragedy, there there are moments of such deep beauty going on that uh, there is absolutely a shift. And I just wonder how much will ever be the same. Nothing will ever be the same. But I mean, as a professional speaker, I. I I spend a lot of my time amongst other professional speakers, uh, many of which who travel 
almost every day of their life. Mm-hmm. And wow. they're home with their families now and they're, th- they're seeing, gosh, I, I, don't, I didn't realize how much I missed seeing my kids grow up. Right. And I wonder, will those, will those individuals ever want to travel as much? How will mm-hmm. that affect their speaking career? Will they choose to place more boundaries? Will they choose to charge more money so they don't have to speak at a, as many events? Will there be as many events? I mean, there's no doubt industry by industry, business by business, there are going to be some major impacts. And while we're kind of hunkering down to figuring out how to survive this, uh, for businesses that want to come out, of, come out of it in a healthy way, need to be looking longer term and thinking, how will the world be different? And how can my business show up? How can I show up as an individual aligned with the new world, not the one that we knew before? Yeah. And, and, you know, in a way, again, that brings us back to your book, Mm -hmm. um, because we need to give companies tools that they can use in order to go towards more of what I use a lot is the word empathy, empathy in business, kindness in business, uh, in, in marketing. And, and it, it, it struck me when I prepared for our conversation that you talk about the five secret languages and, and there is this book, I forgot to look up the author, the five love languages. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's, it's, you know, in a way it's, uh, there are kind of, there are similarities between uh, the two concepts. Um, I'd like to, uh, so there's uh, the secret language of perspective, of familiarity, of style, of pricing, and of words. Mm-hmm. I'd like to go into the first one, the perspective. Talk to us yeah. about what that means. So unlike you, I mean, I actually think empathy is the business word today, right? But to, to really have empathy, the problem is that so many businesses don't they don't really step into empathy. They kind of check it off. <laughs> and that's the way I look at it. I often have referred to lingo as the evolution of buyer personas and avatars because to me, buyer personas and avatars are like a check, check off. Like, okay, I, I understand my ideal customer check, right? But it's so surface level to truly have empathy is to understand the perspective of those that you're going to serve. And by the way, the, those five steps, as I explain them in lingo, uh, need to be done in order. And when I say they need to be done in order, I work almost entirely with companies that have been in in existence for years, decades, centuries. I rarely work with startups. And so when I say start with, it means it's at whatever point a company decides they need to be realigned with today's world, as is going to happen in a tremendous volume after COVID-19. Hopefully a lot of businesses will say, wow, I need to be realigned. It's time for me to understand the lingo, the new lingo perhaps, of my ideal customers. But these five steps need to be done in order because you cannot even attempt. The last step is the, is the words. You can't, even ex, you can't even begin to expect to know the right words, to say the right things, to have the right brand message until you first, with empathy, understand the perspective of those that you want to serve. And that means without judgment, without assumption, imagine if you were they, if you, if you are your ideal customer, what would you need to see, hear, and feel to choose you? How, do you, how does your ideal customer live? What do they value? How do they see the world? Are they innately pessimistic or optimistic? Um, everything. And again, I think the point you were making a moment ago was a really wise one because like the five love languages, which was a very influential book to me as well. Um, you know, there are some, it's a delicate balance between generalizations without stereotyping, right? By no means this is about stereotyping people, but the fact matter is what I have deemed is that these are five emotional triggers that can be true amongst large groups of people. So as a photographer, I served very affluent people and like the English language itself, English as a language may be spoken countrywide, but within that country, there are accents. Similarly, you know, you kind of start with these steps of lingo and understanding the perspective, for example, in a general way, but understanding there are nuances amongst your client base based on geography, socioeconomics, all different things. But perspective as a first step is truly with work understanding the perspective of your ideal customers. How do they live? What do they value? How do they see the world? 
what's important to them? What are their central core values? How do, what do they, how do they work? How do they function? How does their family function? It's really getting to know them. And again, without assumption or judgment, I, again, as I'd said a few times, I, I worked with affluent people, but I grew up lower middle class. The only reason I was able to succeed in that affluent market was because I did the work to understand their perspective on life. And I did so by going to high-end brands and not studying the brand, but by studying the emotional triggers that I felt if I were an affluent person. What was I observing? What was triggering me positively and negatively so that I could adopt their perspective? Mm -hmm. And that's what it means to really understand the perspective. It's work, but you have to put yourself in the shoes of those that you want to, that you're meant to serve. You have to put yourself in their shoes. Yeah, that's so true. And, and, and uh, again, what we do with general marketing is we do that work first on ourselves. Uh, and we look at, you know, our values, our worldview, um, because often as entrepreneurs, if we go into business with a certain passion, it's very likely that our ideal clients are very similar or have similar worldviews to our own worldview. Not always, but mm -hmm. with the kind of coaches and, and entrepreneurs that I work with, it's often the case. And what happened with me with my own business, I never looked at that. I was running an online LinkedIn consulting business for 12 years, and I never thought of bringing in more of me to my marketing, more of me to my business. And so I only looked at the client avatar, who is he and what does he want and how can I best serve him? Um, and I talk about wearing this marketing mask where eventually I woke up and I said, I don't feel aligned with these people. I'm not doing my best work with them because they don't share my values. They don't share my worldview. And so the, the importance and perspective in a way is similar to worldview, right? So what are the, the, what is the client's worldview? And, and again, you, you mentioned uh, who would love that. So who would love your worldview in a way as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's, yeah, there's such a, a layer to values. There's, a, there's an exercise I often do with my coaching clients that I call the five whys, which is I will just keep asking them why. Like, why is that important to you? And they'll answer and say, well, why is that important to you? And I'll do that five times because it kind of drills down. Uh, because when it comes to serving customers, particularly if customers are, uh, if they're very different to us. So let's say, for example, like in my case, growing up low, lower middle class, but serving affluent people. But it might also be, you might be a business that caters to millennial, but you're, you're by no means a millennial, right? Mm -hmm. But understanding the market, um, there are you know, some values that you aren't aligned on, right? Just mm -hmm. because of the differences. But I guarantee you there's a core value. And for me, with my, regardless of where I came from and who I serve, the biggest value that we had in common was the, it was two, actually two. I'd say responsibility and long-term thinking. Mm -hmm. And this is where I was completely misaligned with my own family and where I grew up because I was innately a very long-term thinker. I had life insurance from the age of like 19 years old. Like I've always had life insurance. I always mm -hmm. thought way far ahead. I always planned for the future. Um, so being a photographer was important to me because I believed in capturing life moments that would be handed down from generation to generation. Because when I'm doing a photo shoot, I'm not thinking about the here and now. I'm thinking about the impact of that several generations from now mm -hmm. and as it gets handed down. So I was innately a very long-term thinker. Also, incredibly, I just have always been really buttoned down on being responsible. Like I'm the opposite of a procrastinator. I always show up early for everything. I get everything done early. I get all my homework and school done ahead of time. Sounds um, like myself. <laughs> right? So there were certain characters I came to know myself. And what I, ultimately I had to, when my business was failing in my hometown is when I realized it's because none of this hometown I grew up in did not share these values because it was a you know, lower socioeconomic that they couldn't worry about the future or plan for the future or be responsible to the future because they were worried about putting food on their table that night. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that I needed to find the people that were waiting for me to show up, which happened to be affluent people. Because when you have discretionary income, when you have discretionary money, you plan for the future, right? You put money away. And, and, and like the depth of responsibility was huge amongst affluent people because if you have money, money can't be an excuse. 
So you can't send your oldest child to an Ivy League school and send the other two kids to community college. You can't, right? It's not an acceptable, you know, amongst the kids, they'd be angry. So the parents have to treat all their kids, you know, equally and responsibly. So as their photographer, I made sure all the kids were photographed at the same ages, like everything was equal. I made sure the parents showed up incredibly responsible to their family, friends, and children, right, to support their core value of responsibility. So mm -hmm. while we lived very differently, there are many things about my clients that I may not have been aligned with on values. Um, it was never important to me to have a big dramatic home or you know, material goods. None of that's really important to me, but at the core, we connected on the values of responsibility and long-term thinking. And that I think is true of, 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 for people finding those that they're meant to serve, you really have to look at the core of it. Ask yourself the five whys. Like, why is that important? Why is that important? Like, get to the bottom of it because on surface, you may not be aligned on values because your lifestyles may be dramatically different. But at the core of it, I'll bet there's something you do align on. Yeah so important to do this work on values i agree mm -hmm. yeah. i want to bring up another term i heard you i don't think you've used it in the book but i've heard you use it on one of your episodes and that is aspirational marketing mm, yeah. i just love that term and i want you to explain it yeah so i got a little tired of and it wasn't that i just got tired of it i also think it uh it wore itself out in the marketing world which was the whole idea that uh, to speak to people's pain. Mm -hmm. Now, I will be the first one to say, particularly with the brand as a brand message consultant and the branding work I do for uh, for entrepreneurs on their websites. There, I always say there's two components of brand messaging. One is the first impression when people the opening scene of your website, huge big deal. And then the second component of brand messaging is everything you say after that, and in which order you say it that has impact to move your customers. So one thing we know from buyer psychology is that people do need to see, what we've always been told is that people need to see their pain before they'll seek a solution. And that is true. It's just human psychology. I mean, painkillers outsell vitamins seven to one, right? Mm -hmm. Because people wait for there to be a pain to buy a pill instead of take the vitamins that might've prevented it, right? It's just, it's human nature is that we have to see our pain before we'll seek a solution totally get it. The problem with it became, I got so tired of everybody's marketing looking the same. And it was all these drama stories of pain and how it almost always ended with, but it doesn't have to be like that. <laughs> I mean, almost every paragraph, it was like this pain paragraph and that, but it doesn't have to be like that because, you know, anybody that's received any marketing training has been told that's what you do. You, you tell your pain story and then, but it doesn't have to be like that. And then you tell, you, you point out the dream. And what I started to realize is I said, I think people are just tired of the pain and it doesn't always have. So I turned it into aspirational marketing. Like, what if it isn't always the pain we have to point out? What if, what if it's also what people can be, right? What is it? What about talking to what their life can be? What if we help them paint a picture of what is possible? So now we're, that's what I mean by aspirational marketing. Like I, and I think the time has come for more of that because pain driven marketing has, it still works in the right place, but it's also run its course. And of course, in the world of marketing, people are always looking for the next new thing that, that emotionally moves them. And that's what I mean by aspirational marketing is, is I refer to it with a lot of my clients as let's talk about their pains and gains, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just the pain, although you may have to point out some pain, you may have to point out some pain spots to get them to be open to your solution. It's not all just pain. People are also looking for who they can become, the life they can live, what's possible for them. And that's what I mean by aspirational marketing. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, I think it's still necessary to address the, the pain point, like, because you want them to pay attention to you. And if you're not saying what the problem is, then their brain actually doesn't trigger that you might have a solution. Right. So addressing the pain uh, is, is okay. But it, again, it, you talk about words. Uh, the, the language that we use is so important and uh, we don't need to actually pour salt into the wounds and say how bad of a situation uh, these people people are in and you know we're, there's a lot of t 
talk about creating the gap and, oh my God, you're in such a bad situation. And here's this giant abyss and, and, and yeah. over here is my magic wand and this is my solution. Yuck, right? People, yeah. people don't want that anymore. Um, I, I'm totally with you. And, yeah. and it's so much more beautiful if you can talk about, uh, you know, what could be. And, and, and so I really love that term aspirational marketing. I think that's Sarah, the, the biggest challenge marketers have today, and if you're in business, you're a marketer. So let's just be clear on that. <laughs> so um, it's like, you know, I'm an author and the first one of the smartest things I learned is I said, you're not in the book writing business, you're in the book selling business. Like the moment you write a book, you're in the book selling business, because okay. if, if you don't sell it, 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 you're not moving, you're not changing lives. Um, so the, one of the, the, so again, if you're in business, you're a marketer. One of the core challenges of marketers, and please, I want everybody to hear this, is that the people you're speaking to are far more sophisticated than you're giving them credit for. Mm, I love that. I find it so offensive. You remember years ago in marketing, we were always told, and literally, and thankfully, a lot of people won't even remember this, but again, I've been in business 35 years. We used to literally be told to market to the mentality of a five-year-old. Yeah. Like people were so dumb and you had to make it so simple that you had to market it as if you were speaking to a five-year-old. Well, nothing could be further from the truth today. Five-year-olds are now some of your more sophisticated consumers there are. Like, they are so smart. They're, so I think one of the biggest challenges for marketers today is understanding that your customers or would-be customers are incredibly sophisticated. They can see through the smoke and mirrors. They can see when you're, they can feel when you're inauthentic. They can, they, they will tire of a trend, you know? So if they get tired of the pain trend, they're going to look for something else. It's also why this is how I refer to the challenge of attention. I don't for a moment buy into the theory that we humans have devolved to having a shorter retention span because Netflix will be the first one to dispute that, right? I mean, people will binge on a, a movie or a series for a whole weekend. So there's no problem with the shortage of attention. The problem is, is consumers are so much more sophisticated and have a lot of choices of what they give their attention to that they're holding us as businesses to very high standards as to whether we're attention worthy. Yeah. It's not and that they don't have attention. It's like they want that you have to you have to earn their attention. You have to stand out. You have to be attention worthy. Then you'll get their attention. And maybe you can keep it if you keep the interest there. But if you're, if you're not interesting enough in the beginning, it's not, it's not the lack of attention. It's consumers are so much more sophisticated today. So true. And especially you talk about millennials quite a bit as well. Imagine they grew up with the internet and they have seen so smart. Know, how many of these <laughs> sales pages that just ask these pain questions. <laughs> and, yeah, and Sarah, you know, and you know, the way in which they're smart, which I know means so much to you is they're, they're empathetic, yes. right? Millennial buyers are so attuned to genuineness. Like the thing that, I don't know if you remember last fall, the Peloton bicycle commercial controversy. No, um, I've not heard about that. Okay. No. So Bell, Peloton bicycle is, you know, an at-home bicycle that you can, along with an app, you can take cycle classes live right. with other people. They ran an ad during Christmas that turned into a huge controversy, kind of on both sides. First, the first controversy was people were freaked out by the ad, myself included. I saw this ad, I'm like, something is really off. Like it made you uncomfortable because it was this husband giving his very beautiful, attractive wife a bicycle and she's maybe a size one, if that, and she was so nervous about exercise and you're like, oh, come on, you clearly have spent some time in a fitness class. Like it just was something was so off and there was this little element of sexism about it. Like why is the husband giving his wife this bicycle? Like did she want it? Is he suggesting something? Like it was just off is the only way I can describe it. But then the other side of the controversy became all the people that were like, you know, calling those of us that had a problem with the ad, calling us snowflakes and things like that. Like, oh my God, is the world so sensitive that things like this blow up? Like, isn't there better things, bigger things than to talk about? Like, so it, it was a controversy on both sides. So in my effort to kind of unpack, because I was one of the first people to criticize it, I just felt like it was so weird. And 
And the end of the day, when I really sat down and analyzed it, the problem with that ad, and I believe the reason it blew up is because it was this forced inauthenticity. Mm-hmm. The acting, the look on her face, the fact that it just, everything about it was off. And it, in the end, it just felt like it was this forced authenticity, but it was inauthentic because it was forced. Millennials and most of the people that responded negatively to that ad could feel it was off. So one of the ways in which consumers today are so much more sophisticated and smarter is because they're not just intellectually smarter, they're actually relying on their gut and how they feel and the energy that companies are giving off. And if that feels off, I mean, there, it's, it's like, I think we've heard that like our guts are almost a bigger brain than the one in our head. Right. And a lot of consumers, and this is why I wrote Lingo, one of the primary motivators for writing the, word, the book Lingo was because I felt like we were finally living in a time when people were making business decisions, who they would do business with based on how they felt about that business more than anything else. One of the quotes that I've used to demonstrate that is that people don't hire you because you're the best. People hire you because they feel like you get them. Right. Right. And I grew up, I built my business in the 80s and 90s when... It had, had nothing to do with how they felt about you. It had everything to do with label, prestige, and quality. Because again, working with affluent people, they, many of them would work with designers, interior designers that were the biggest divas you could imagine. And they would put up with the most obnoxious behavior because that was the person to have. Right. Well, nowadays, that doesn't fly at all. The moment a company feels misaligned with the values of those they serve, there's an uproar. Yeah. So I think one of the ways people are smarter, consumers are smarter today, is that they're emotionally, they're emotionally intelligently, you know, emotional intelligence is at a much higher level, and they're relying on that. And I think I, I love that. I mean, that's that's why I wrote the book. It's the future of business that I would like to see. I'm so glad you you said that because what I also think is a danger in in some businesses and 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 entrepreneurs misunderstood is this idea of vulnerability. The minute, you know, Brene Brown started to talk about vulnerability, all of a sudden you could see all these marketers uh, using vulnerability in order to sell. And it just really felt that way. Oh, let me dig out this really old story um, and use that in order to appeal more to my audience. And you you if it doesn't tell. feel authentic, people no. call you out on it. Yeah. yeah. It's, I did a video actually a while back called End With Why yeah. because I love Simon Sinek. Totally grateful for the conversation he started around Start With Why. Like he, you know, back, gosh, I don't, what, I don't even know what year it was. It's been a long time since he did his TEDx talk. <laughs> and thank goodness, right? He got a conversation started in business that hadn't been there before. Right. In, helping businesses see that people cared more about why you do what you do than how you do it. Um, so he great conversations. The problem is that so many marketers jumped on the start with why bandwagon that then we had every company talking only about themselves. Yeah. I would go to website after website, which is what I do professionally every day, looking at websites. And all I see is companies talking about themselves, giving their why. I'm like, but this isn't about you. <laughs> this is supposed to be about your customer. So I did this video called End With Why because, yeah, people want to know your why and it gives up. But my feeling is to engage with people. It has to be about them, right? Your messaging has to be about them. Then you end with why to the point that when they read your why, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so in love with this business. Like there's no other business I'd rather work with because now that you compelled me by you know, thinking about me and knowing me so much and now I read your why, I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally get it. Like nobody can do what you do except you. That's, That's so why funny. I, I, I was laughing because I have one of my chapters that literally says end with the why. So yeah, say, same, same thinking here. It's like, yeah. no, the why is important, but it's not the first thing. And, and again, yeah. I think probably what triggered my thinking is this overuse of uh, vulnerability in marketing. So yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Wow, um, we could keep on going. <laughs> I want to make sure I bring in one more thing and then we kind of wrap up. But you talk about uh, reciprocal communication in the last mm-hmm. chapter. Yeah. And in that last chapter, you actually, I think, mentioned that you hesitated to actually make it the first one because in your opinion, it's almost the, the most important one. Tell mm-hmm. us about that one. So when I was... <laughs> Lingo... Well, I wrote Lingo in 2017. It was released in 2000, January of 2018. The year before that, so in 2016, I had written in, in a book that never got published. And it was, it was never published because after I wrote it, it was very heavy, heavy on the self-help side. And I wrote it because from my perspective of those that wanted to serve, self-employed folks, the reason I wanted to, I felt like, you know, to be self-employed, as I said earlier, means, often means that we need to work on oneself first. So I wrote this book about working on yourself first before I gave, and then the later book would be more about business strategy. The problem was, and I, I agreed with the professionals that advised me that it was going to put me in kind of the self-help world uh, and take me out of the real work I wanted to do. My real mission is to help self-employed people succeed. So we decided not to publish that book. And then I wrote Lingo with a little bit more of a strategy in mind, right? Um, However, I couldn't let go of my core belief that, uh, which is based on, my core belief is, is taken from a Jim Rohn quote, which is, our level of success rarely exceeds our level of personal development. So I have always believed in developing oneself and raising, if you will, kind of the ceiling of your growth. And as you raise the ceiling of your growth, all the success that's meant for you comes up to meet that ceiling. And then you raise the ceiling again and your level of success increases again. So it's very much an inside out process. So I gave everybody what I felt they needed to get in lingo in the first two thirds of the book. And then the book takes a pretty dramatic turn. And I say in it, well, now that I've given you all the strategy, now let me talk about what you need on the inside. And reciprocal communication is one of them. And, and it was one of the hardest lessons for me to learn in life because I'm a go-getter. I'm a really hard worker. I'm an entrepreneur. You know, so everybody listening probably feels the same way. And because of that, I realized, I looked back and realized that energetically I'd kind of I'll say pushed my my way to success. And I don't mean that I didn't walk over people or anything like that, but I never, I didn't. I realized I didn't have a high level of trust that anything was going to get done unless I did it, right? On a day-to-day basis, as well as just on a life basis. Like I just had this overwhelming feeling like my success was totally up to me. Therefore, I had to work hard. Mm -hmm. And what I learned through years in business and probably with some maturity of age is that there's a reciprocal communication going on between you and your world, you and your universe. Um, And what I started paying close attention to was how often in business I wanted something that the world didn't want for me. So that's what I mean by reciprocal communication. So sometimes we can, we can set a goal for ourselves that we are so positive we want, and it doesn't happen, and we fight for it, we fight for it. I think instead of wasting our time beating our head against a wall, it's very important to pay attention to, does what you want want you back as much? And the example I give in the book is um, my TEDx talk. I applied for 12, well, it was on the 13th TEDx talk that I finally got one. So I had applied, tw- applied and rejected 12 times. And every rejection hurt. Every rejection was frustrating. And I, when all was said and done on the 13th application, when I was chosen to give it a TEDx talk, which was over two years of time, it was you know, in New York City, which had been, I had been living in Miami for a couple of years at that point, so, but New York City is my hometown. So it was in New York City. All three of my kids were able to be there without having to get on a plane. They just simply drove to the event. Mm. It was my hometown. It was meaningful to me. I had tons of friends there. And I realized that if I had gotten any one of the previous 12 TEDx talks, none of them would have been as meaningful as the one I got. Mm-hmm. So what I realized is the universe was taking care of me all along. I, had a, I should have just listened earlier on. <laughs> I shouldn't have worked so hard to try to bust through. And I think we entrepreneurs do that a lot. We're constantly trying to bust through instead of paying close attention to maybe there's a, a bigger level of care taking place that what you want isn't meant for you right now and to move on and to wait for either to catch up or maybe there's something else. And that's, that's the depth of understanding about reciprocal communication is to just paying really close attention as to whether 
what you want wants you back just as much? Or are you trying to bust through something that just isn't meant for you right now, maybe later on? That's a, a beautiful way to, to end our conversation because it leaves us with so much food for thought, right? Um, I, during the whole time, I'm reading a quote that I have sitting on my desk. Set a goal so big that you can't reach it until you become the person who can. There you go. I need a daily reminder as well. There's, there's so much wisdom around that, but it took me a long time to learn that lesson, Sarah. I'll tell you, it took me a long time. But once I did, as is often the case, right? Once we learn something, we realize, gosh, that there's such an ancient wisdom in that. Like people have been quoting similar things all along, but again, not paying attention to it. So I think it's one of the most profound lessons in business, uh, which again, Jim Rohn, one of my heroes, uh, I read his quotes all the time. I've read numerous of his books. And that his, by far my favorite quote that I live by is that quote that our level of success, similar to your quote, our level of success rarely exceeds our level of personal development. Mm, yeah. Wow. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. My pleasure. Thank on. you for having me. I, wanna, uh, I want you to share with everyone um, where people can find you. Of course, mm -hmm. they can find your book, Lingo, on Amazon, but please tell, tell them about your podcast and your website. Sure. Well, everything is centralized uh, on my website, which is jeffreyshaw.com. So there you'll find a page about the Lingo book, which of course, as you said, can be purchased on Amazon or anywhere you buy books. Uh, the podcast is Creative Warriors, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, you name it, it's all over. Um, but everything is centralized at jeffreyshaw.com. I'm also all over social media, uh, typically by the same name, uh, sometimes jeffreyshaw1 on Twitter. Uh, but yeah, reach out on social. Um, love to connect. Wonderful. One last question. What are you grateful for today, Jeffrey? Oh, gosh. Um, what am I grateful for today? And that's the criteria. You know, what I've been grateful for so much lately during this COVID-19 time is that I live where I live. I, I just, I'm so blessed with this beautiful apartment on the water in Miami. And, you know, with so many people being sick, uh, knowing that there's this deadly virus circulating at such a rapid pace, but yet I can stand on my terrace and look out at the ocean and it all just looks so beautiful and peaceful. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful to have that, that view literally that view, which changes, of course, my inner view of mm. that we will get through this. And I am grateful for uh, just visions of peace to remind me during this time. Wonderful. I don't have an ocean view, but I have a, a nature view as well. And it's true. It's, it's just it's, as it's beautiful. An anchor. Yeah. It's an anchor for us in these it times. Is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. My pleasure, Sarah. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Thanks so much for listening. Please do check out the show notes for this episode at sarahsnecroci.com forward slash GBR37. It includes all the links, all the resources we mentioned in today's episode. And if you share my worldview, I would love to hang out with you in the gentle business circle. That's a new thing here, and it's a safe zone to hang out with other imaginal selves and help each other build our business and grow our impact. When you join the circle, you get one live monthly circle Q&A call with me and fellow gentle marketers. And no worries if you can't make it live, we'll obviously record it. You also get a monthly newsletter in the replay. And as a bonus, I'm including my new authentic and fair pricing mini course. So these calls take place once per month, every second Wednesday of the month. And there are different levels of support starting out at $7 per month. Uh, you can find out all about it by going to sarasinacroce.com forward slash circle. Thank you so much. I hope you'll join me on this journey to a kinder marketing paradigm. Please invite your friends to join us by sharing this episode or the Gentle Business Manifesto with them. Both can be found at thegentlebusinessrevolution.com. Let's be the change we want to see in the world. See you soon.